Hi everyone, my name is Golan and I've been working at MyHeritage for the last four years as a user experience expert. I'm very honored to talk to you today about our unique Tribal Quest project. Just a quick disclaimer to align expectations. My talk is not going to be about technology or applications or features, but rather a little bit about adventure and people and the way they interact. But first I want to tell you briefly how this project came to be. And in order for me to do so, I would like to mention this person, who I assume many of you are familiar with. This is Gilad Yefet, founder and CEO of MyHeritage. Once I had this idea of launching a MyHeritage project, guided by the purpose of enabling indigenous groups to preserve their own family histories, I started working on a pitch to convince Gilad how important this initiative is. I was working on this presentation for over three months, trying to perfect every single detail. When the scheduled day of the meeting arrived, I stepped into Gilad's office, preparing myself for the very likely scenario of being kicked out after one minute on account of this idea being so far-fetched and delirious. Instead, I never got to continue past the third slide. Gilad immediately realized the significance of such a project and told me that if I can make it happen, he is going to give it a green light. And I guess you can say the rest is history. I held different positions in different companies in my lifetime, and I can assure you without a shadow of a doubt that it takes a very unusual organizational DNA to turn such a dream into a reality by encouraging employees to come up with their own thoughts and ideas. And there are many other examples at MyHeritage demonstrating this very principle. I think that Tribal Quest in particular also goes to show how far literally this company is willing to go in order to pursue the values it stands for. So what is Tribal Quest? And by the way, all of the people that you see here are among the ones we met during our expeditions. It is a pro bono project born out of a real necessity. The total population of indigenous communities is estimated at over 370 million people spread across more than 72 countries worldwide. For the most part, they live in isolated tribal formations still maintaining ancient traditions. But since they are now facing a constantly growing overlap with modern society, their unique identity is gradually getting eroded or blurred. This means some of those distinct groups are rapidly losing their cultures, traditions, languages, and oral histories. Global attempts are being made to document and preserve the cultural heritage of such, such indigenous societies. Yet these attempts all seem to observe each community as a whole, from an anthropological point of view. As individuals, the vast majority of those people are nameless. Nobody knows their story. Their family structure is not charted. Eventually, their memory will fade away and their future descendants will know nothing about them. This is where my heritage steps in. We believe our lives and family values are shaped by the generations that came before us, and we want to give every single person the opportunity to have his or her own family story told and perpetuated. As a result, Tribal Quest is our attempt to harness the tools and capabilities developed by MyHeritage in order to create an ever-expanding database documenting the identities, personal stories, and families of people living in tribal communities around the world for the sake of their future generations. So where did we go? They say that the journey of a thousand miles begin with a single step. Our first step is always home base Israel. From our offices there, we launched all of our expeditions so far, selecting remote destinations where our presence can make the most difference. The first expedition was to Namibia in 2015. It was followed by another expedition to Papua New Guinea during 2016. And last year, the third phase of the project was held in Siberia, Russia. Each project's duration is between three to four weeks and the teams consist entirely of MyHeritage employees specially selected and trained for the mission. 
This is a group of young people who at their daily jobs work for my heritage as R&D or product people in marketing, business intelligence, design, or human resources. And those projects throw them miles away from their comfort zone, isolated from their family and friends, facing cultural environments and living conditions they have never encountered in their lives. Now multiply the pressure by giving them an extremely demanding task, so those guys really have to cope with mental and psychological stress, physical challenges, and the huge element of fatigue. I would like to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of them for their amazing endurance and contribution. In Namibia, we visited the Himba tribe located in the northern Konena region. In Papua New Guinea, we met five different tribes located in three regions, Hagen, the Karawari River, and the Wagi Valley. Here is a fascinating fact about Papua New Guinea. It is one of the most culturally diverse places on the planet, with more than 800 tribes living there. Each of them speaks a completely distinguished language. That is a language, not a dialect. Since there are approximately 7,000 living languages existing in the world today, that means a staggering number, over 10% of them, can be found in Papua New Guinea. In Siberia, we traveled to the Yamal Peninsula to meet the nomadic reindeer herders of the Nenets tribe, who live under the most extreme conditions imaginable, with a temperature that drops well below minus 50 Celsius degrees at night time during the winter. In the Nenets language, the meaning of the word Yamal is the edge of the world. When adding up the numbers of all three expeditions, you can see that so far we already documented more than 10,000 people. On top of those, we collected dozens of thousands of genealogical facts and details, profile photos, personal stories, family stories, and video interviews. I want to try and share with you the atmosphere of participating in such an expedition by showing you a short clip from the Papua New Guinea project, capturing the experience from the team's perspective. Hello, good morning. It's nice to see you. Welcome to my country, Papua New Guinea. Okay, like I previously mentioned, the destinations we visited are extremely remote, which means it was pretty complicated to get there, but also to make our way from one place to another after actually arriving. For this reason, we had to use diverse means of transportation to travel internally. Small planes are the only way to penetrate the dense jungles of Papua New Guinea when trying to reach villages located along river banks. When already in the region, you need to ride a motorized canoe to get from one village to another. Despite the fact rivers are crawling with crocodiles, riding such a canoe under a starry sky with rain showers and a lightning storm is honestly a spiritual out-of-body experience. 
The red desert dusty terrain of Namibia called for a four-wheel drive and proved to be truly challenging and demanding. And then there was Siberia, with its endless Arctic tundra that for us, Israeli minions, seemed to be from outer space. This is a difficult and dangerous landscape to navigate in, and we were moving around inside wooden crates dragged, dragged by snowmobiles, or on top of the Nenet's own handmade wooden sleds led by a pack of reindeer, or at the back of those monstrous vehicles called trecols. This is really the ultimate means of transportation for the Siberian terrain and weather conditions, going through steep obstacles and soft, deep snow layers. We were told that its wheels are designed that way, that if they run over somebody laying on the ground, he can simply stand up, dust the snow off his shoulders and continue walking as if nothing happened. Not that I felt any desire to validate this argument. And yes, even those mean machines break down from time to time. Because of the cold weather, we used the back of the trecol as a multi-purpose space, where we would hold uh, uh, work meetings, store our equipment, interview people, but also where we would have our meals and take some time to rest. Here is a clip demonstrating the working environment inside the trecol. Next, I want to try to explain what is it that we actually did on site. So once we manage to get to a place where one of the tribe's families is located, first we introduce ourselves and the motivation behind our visit. And only after everybody feels comfortable to continue, we look for the best, for the best available space where we can conduct our session, either outdoors or indoors. Since such a working session can take anything between three or four hours to a full day, it is very important that we find a location that can act as a shelter, from the cold, from the sun, from the rain, from the dust, from the mosquitoes, from the noise, where people can also gather. At the beginning of every session, we always try to identify the key characters of the family, those that seem to be most knowledgeable about the family history and the meaningful events, and on top of that, are outgoing and expressive enough to communicate with us. In most cases, this meant we were actually talking to the elders of the family, which always led to a fascinating conversation. Before we delve into the more technical part of building the family tree and gathering all of the factual details, such as names, places, and dates, we hold an open interview, during which we ask the people we talk to to tell us a little bit about themselves, their occupations and daily lives, about childhood memories or any significant events that shaped their lives, about dreams and aspirations, about thoughts and wishes they want to pass on to their future generations, and so on. However, you must realize that this is far from being a controlled environment, and the teams always had to expect the unexpected. So just to give you a small taste, in one of the occasions we ran into this Nenets camp and met this somewhat dysfunctional family where more or less all of the adults present were drunk, but still fairly happy and willing to communicate. So it started with an interview conducted outside in the open tundra, continued with a very unusual family shot that included a puppy that suddenly appeared from inside of a fur coat and a limping dog. <laughs> and 
and eventually ended up with this old woman who at the beginning waved her fists and cursed us, but then inside the tent really got into the process of the tree building and kept shouting out uh, family names. So here you saw her in the arms of Rosa, our translator, who was calming her down. But as she was still very drunk, for some reason she felt an irresistible compulsion to grab my bald head by her hand and pet it and then stick her thumbs straight into my eyes. <laughs> So you see what I mean when I say just another day at the office. Now we record all the information on video and in parallel manually load the data onto our family tree builder application, the FTB, which we were using in an offline mode. We use the very same application when we get to the stage of building the family tree. But simultaneously, we also developed some very basic yet effective techniques in order to sort out and organize the information. For example, we discovered that charting the family diagram on top of a whiteboard together with the people we talk to, giving them the ability to better understand what we do and how we do it, is a highly efficient way to promote collaboration and untangle family relation complexities. For instance, we encountered an unusual pattern, social pattern in Papua New Guinea involving adoption. In some tribes, it is very common to adopt children for a wide range of reasons. If you are a younger sister who got married and gave birth to a child before your older sister, you need to give her your child to adopt. If your older brother has only girls and your wife gave birth to a baby boy, you must pass him to your brother. If you owe someone money, but you can't repay him, you need to, gi to give him one of your children for adoption instead. If by tragic misfortune some of your children died at young age, you must give the remaining children to another family member to adopt in order to protect them from any curse or evil spirit. So going back to the whiteboard, um, many times... It took a tedious and frustrating effort to actually understand the nature of relationships and map out biological connections as opposed to others. And it was only possible through a process of trial and error by sketching and discussing and erasing and over and over again until we got it right. One other thing that was extremely important to us was to gather and capture any documents we could find. On rare occasions, we were lucky enough to find old photographs. In such cases, we tried our best to identify as many people as possible and tag them on site in a way that will enable us to trace and reconstruct the information in an orderly manner later on when we upload everything onto the computer. Other times, we were able to find uh, birth and death certificates, union cards, church documentation, uh, school reports, and even things like this handwritten contract describing the purchase agreement of two goats. And then there are objects and artifacts, like this small sculpted toy made out of mammoth ivory that has been passed down through generations from mother to daughter, or this bear's tooth placed over the baby's crib for protection against evil spirits, or this gun that was bought by this man's uncle for the staggering price of 26 cows just to be confiscated by the police and miraculously returned back to the family many years later. By the way, this person offered to buy our own team member Marina in order to take her as another wife for two cows and one goat. One last interesting source of information we found was tribal cemeteries. When those existed, they were usually located in remote, isolated places, and only the elders would know how to lead us there. Here you see a cemetery in Namibia, where you can judge the wealth of a dead man according to the bull skulls decorating his grave. The other fascinating thing here is the fact that those people adapted the modern Western convention of having marble tombstones with, with inscriptions, but then the text itself is so different to what we are familiar with. This one, 
belongs to a person, a person from the Ngombe tribe, and it says he was a beloved son to his father, a good farmer of livestock, and a brave man who fought the war against the white people, and during his lifetime killed two lions and an elephant. Another significant aspect of our work is the visual documentation. Apart from getting all of the interview sessions recorded, we also strive to capture the people, their being, their environment, and daily lives. In order to do so, we take a profile photo of each and every person we meet and associate it later with his or her entity in the relevant family tree. Here, once again, we take advantage of the whiteboard as a safety measure to make sure we match the right person with the right profile photo. This particular child, by the way, is indeed named The Wire, apparently after a popular music band from South Africa. We also made a huge effort to assemble as many, as many family members as we could gather into one group shot, since we understand the significance of such photos as family legacy assets. Just think about the old photo you may have found once in your grandmother's attic, where an entire family, including some of your direct ancestor, stands together and poses for the camera. This is a priceless, a priceless treasure. You must realize that the vast majority of those people were hardly ever photographed. And even if they were, it was by travelers who passed by, meaning they do not have any actual physical copy of the photograph for themselves. The process of getting organized and arranging everybody for the shot always brought out the unique characteristics of each family and really emphasized the social dynamics between the family members. Suddenly, you could really see who is dominant and who is passive, whether it is the father or the mother who is shouting out the orders, who is the most mischievous child of the entire bunch, or simply where in the overall frame every person decides to stand. It was also, every single time we did it, accompanied by a lot of joy and exhilaration. I want to show you here a typical scenario of the preparation phase for taking such a photo. Okay, everybody smile to the camera! Good! Big flalaf! We really wanted to leave them something tangible as a memory. So for this purpose, we, uh, we did two things. We brought with us Polaroid cameras and gave them the photos to keep. And I cannot describe the level of excitement around when the magic happens and their faces suddenly appear on paper out of nowhere. The second thing was more complicated and time consuming. When we got back to Israel, we finalized the work on all of the family trees and then we produced high quality large scale durable sun charts and printed them out and sent them back to all of the families that we met along with their laminated family photos. One of the biggest challenges our teams had to face was adapting to living in places very different to what they're familiar with. In the first project in Namibia, we wanted to stay as close as we could to the Himba people. But because the villages consist of tiny windowless mud huts, it was not possible for them to accommodate us. And we had to drive for hours back and forth from a single base camp every day in order to visit the different families. However, when we got to Papua New Guinea, we already insisted on staying among the tribes we work with. And this became our home away from home for the entire period of our visit to the village of Yimas. And this decision really paid off, because there is a huge difference uh, between coming in as an outsider visitor, asking questions and then disappearing in the evening into your fancy lodge or whatever, and actually living with the people, trying to absorb and experience things from their point of view. This resulted in bringing down the barriers much faster and helped people we met to open up much easily, up to the point that we were literally accepted as part of the village, and this person you see here, Robin, decided that his family is going to adopt our team members Tal and Shachar, giving them the tribal names Mandikara and Mandigamba, which means in turn in uh, spirit of the water and spirit of the stone. But living in an open hut in the middle of the tropical jungle can also be quite demanding. There is not a square millimeter of privacy. Uh, this is how you collect water for the next day. 
and this is how you purify it. By the way, if you do not think it is possible to have over 100% of humidity, I urge you to visit Papua New Guinea. This place basically makes you sweat through areas in your body you didn't even know existed. And then there are these guys. So it's true, we had mosquito nets, but once mosquitoes manage to get inside same time you do, and they manage to, you are in for an unforgettable night. Washing the laundry is done along the river, and so is washing yourself, which really stretches the boundaries of the definition of shared bathrooms. Now, since fully immersing ourselves in the situation resulted in a much more profound experience for all of the involved stake stakeholders, when planning the third phase in Siberia, we knew we are aiming for a similar framework. But because of the unbelievably isolated and secluded nature of the Nenets way of living, this meant only one thing, sleeping overnights together with the people in the tombs, which are their teepee-like tents covered with reindeer skins. Once again, it took the level of intimacy up a notch, a fact that was extremely valuable, since the Ninets, as a general rule of thumb, are very, very introvert and shy, unlike the Papuans. According to the sleeping arrangements, our hosts would usually allocate one side of the tomb for our needs, which was always, always warm and cozy despite the freezing cold outside. The clear advantage for us, whenever we got the chance to create such a deeper engagement with the local tribe, was that once we were finished with our daily routines, which normally lasted till very late and included adjusting the family trees, backing up materials and charging all of our devices using a generator we brought with us, we were still surrounded by the people we came to meet and work with, so we were able to get to know them better and vice versa. As in any other place in the world, children were the most curious and the first to open up and communicate. They were very interested to listen to us explaining about ourselves, where we came from, how we live, what we eat, and they were amazed by how different all of those stories are from what they know. In particular, they loved looking at photos of other children, be them our own family members, or those we encountered in other Tribal Quest projects, and it always made them laugh and draw comparisons. You could clearly see how eager they were to play, to experiment, to interact, and basically just to enjoy life, have fun, and behave like children while they still can. It was also very interesting to see how creative they can get when they need to come up with ways to entertain themselves or communicate with others. On our end, it was a much needed relief from our grinding workflow, a time to just put aside all of our concerns and worries and simply unwind. And personally for me, as a father, it was heartwarming and emotional to interact with the children and it enabled me to gain a much wider perspective about what it means to be a child and how parents should define or not define boundaries for their children when preparing them for the challenges of real life. The only thing I will say in this context is that wherever we went, no matter how hard and demanding were the circumstances they were facing or how materialistically little they seemed to have, they were always, always unquestionably happy. Going back to Siberia, as I previously mentioned, penetrating the thick defense armor of the adults proved to be a far more challenging task. However, once they allowed us to accompany them during their daily chores and routines, we started to notice a change in their approach. This involved fetching ice and snow for boiling water, getting firewood to feed the stove, and then handling the stove itself, cooking and cleaning, looking after the children, feeding them, putting them to sleep, or playing with them, taking care of the dogs, the occasional cat, and believe it or not, even the one rabbit we saw. It also involved working with the reindeer, which are a major part of the Ninit's life, 
we will get back to them later on during the presentation or even going with those two brothers to pull a fishing net they placed under the ice using nothing but their bare hands and then eventually little by little those very severe hard faces loosen up and the people allow themselves to crack a smile now when talking about getting to know the people through their day-to-day -day lives i couldn't resist but to show this photo of himba women visiting the town supermarket in order to get supplies and groceries for their families i think this rather surreal image tells so much about the himba these people are exposed to modern life and aware of what it has to offer yet they are so proud and confident of who they are and where they belong that it cannot make make them change their beliefs or traditions for us being able to witness how such traditions and ceremonies are practiced was one of the most fascinating and often exhilarating parts of the projects so these are the same himba women only this time in their more familiar environment performing the joyful rhythmic clapping dance mainly reserved for celebrating meaningful events in the tribe's life in siberia we learned about some interesting ceremonies revolving around marriage that draw reference from old traditions for example in the past some of the women were kidnapped to be wed against the will of their families being tied to sleds and smuggled from their parents camp nowadays during the wedding ceremony while the newlyweds leave the bride's family's camp to head off to start their life in the groom's family's camp some nenets still lay the bride on one of the sleds and cover her with layers of fur to reference this ancient pattern of behavior in some places along the tundra the bride's family gives the newlyweds half of all of the items and materials needed to build the chum wooden poles flooring surfaces about 30 reindeer skins and so on the couple then moves in with the husband's with the husband's family and the woman has to saw and prepare the cover for the second half of the chum only when she is finished they can leave the parents home and set their own chum independently in papua new guinea we met people who scarred their body with a crocodile skin pattern as part of their initiation ceremony we heard stories about people's great grandparents who were headhunters and were allowed to marry as many women as the number of enemy tribes skulls they brought back to the spirit house and probably most memorable of all not only did we get to attend several very colorful sing sing ceremonies through which each tribe presents its own unique stories and heritage but we were also invited to actively participate in some of them the chimbu tribe for example is very famous for its skeleton sing sing uh, and that bold guy you see in the middle is actually none other than myself now i can tell you that right after the sing sing we were lucky enough to pass through a point where internet connection was available and i was able to make a video call back home i have three children and they never but i mean never shut up for a second but when they saw me like this you can only imagine how deep was the silence coming from the other end and if we got to the fun stuff uh, it's impossible not to mention the food so whenever we came back home from a tribal quest expedition the question that we were asked the most was always what did you eat there so while i admit that in namibia we were still not brave enough to try the local cuisine in papua new guinea we already felt quite adventurous apparently there are 1000 different varieties of bananas and i suspect from personal experience that most of those can be found in papua new guinea by the time we returned back home none of us could even look at the direction of a banana banana leaves by the way were also used to cook vegetables in the ground sometimes we got to eat fish and once we had the opportunity to join some of the men for crocodile hunting at night time so guess what we had for dinner the next day lastly this charming and very well-built man called zacharias showed us how to extract the starch from a sago palm 
The starch is a main ingredient in the local diet and it is used for the preparation of porridge and pancakes. However, in the middle of the process, um, Zacharias found something considered a delicacy hidden within the trunk. Yep. So these chubby guys are called sago grubs. And all I'm willing to say is that they are crunchy. In Siberia, a completely different story. First of all, the Ninets hardly drink any water, but they do consume anything between 5 to 10 teacups a day. And each tea time involves an entire ceremony in which everybody huddles around this tiny and very low table with dry bread and dry biscuits and sweet condensed milk and jam and candy. Generally speaking, uh, the amount of sugar spread across the table could easily kill an elephant. Beside that, there is a lot of alcohol in the form of vodka. After tasting it, I'm actually not certain it was vodka and not petrol, but you are required to show respect to your host, so you need to drink up. I must say that building a family tree after such a session is not the easiest thing in the world. You also get a lot of fish, sometimes cooked, sometimes raw, and a lot of reindeer meat, again, sometimes cooked, sometimes raw, with blood to drink next to it. We had a few team members who felt courageous enough to give it a try. I will say that if your body is not used to such, such sort of food, there will be a hell of a price to pay. And I don't want to get any more explicit than that. But this is why I fondly gave this slide the title Two Donkeys and a Reindeer. And since we entered the realm of digestion, another question we were asked over and over again was how we managed ourselves. So in short, it was complicated. The Ninets are very shy and easily embarrassed. So we were specifically told that when we have to go, we need to go and go and go so that we won't be seen. And do understand that because everything is so flat, they can see you miles away to the horizon. And many times you wish you hadn't drunk the last cup of tea, especially considering the fact that this can happen along the way. To wrap up this topic, I can proudly say we have stayed with the Ninets for so long that we actually know what the reindeer like the most. Let's talk about migration, maybe the most spectacular thing one can witness when visiting the Ninets. And to talk about migration, we have to talk first of all about the reindeer, since they define the very existence of the Ninets. There are about 10,000 nomadic Ninets in the tundra, herding more than 600,000 domesticated reindeer, and the size of a single herd can even reach 7,000 7, reindeer. It is important to understand that there is a deep symbiosis between the reindeer and the nenets, and the nenets depend on them for their survival. They sell their meat, but they eat it as well. They also sell the antlers to the Asian market, where people believe they possess virtues that improve male potency. They use their skins for shelter, as the material from which they prepare the covers for the chum, for their clothing and their boots. They are also a means of transportation, pulling the sleds of the entire convoy during migration. And on top of everything, they have a great spiritual significance for the Ninets. One of the people we met told us, for us, the reindeer mean the same as the air you breathe means for you. The reindeer eat a strutty type of grass called lichen, and the very reason for migrating in the first place is to enable them to reach new grazing areas. During the migration season, a family may travel more than 1,000 kilometers and it will advance up to 20 kilometers in a single day. By the end of the winter, an intensive period of migration begins, which means the Ninets disassemble their camp and continue moving forward every second day. It is very difficult to comprehend that people in the 21st century can still live this way, and even more so that it is a lifestyle born 
willingly out of free choice. So, migration day begins at sunset, where the chum with its entire content is taken down by the women within one or two hours. At the same time, the men leave to fetch the reindeer and lead them back to the campground. Then they use lassos to capture and harness the ones they want to lead the sleds. The dogs help to direct and flank the reindeer and it is really amazing to see them in action. When the whole camp is folded and packed onto the sleds, the convoy is ready to start its journey. Some of the Nenets agreed to put Go GoPro cameras on their heads to give us an opportunity to experience this epic event from their point of view. This is what we got. Yes, so it is indeed very dramatic. And when the convoy is in motion, its length can easily reach several miles from one end to another. And someone in the team commented that it looks like a scene from a Star Wars movie. It is an awe-inspiring sight to witness, which completely distills the essence of the Nenets, their core, who they are, and how they crave freedom. It also clearly demonstrates the importance of the family unit for those people. They have to face the most challenging elements of nature on their own, and the smallest mistake can be fatal. They have no one in the world to count on but their family. So they must collaborate with one another seamlessly and trust each other blindly in order to survive. At the end of the exhausting day of migration, the tombs must be erected again. The women actually lay out the tomb architectural plan on top of the snow first, and then build it from bottom to top and inside out. And look at this beautiful and symbolic moment. Lastly, I want to show you a time lapse taken using a GoPro camera. Uh, because the coal drains the battery very quickly, we had to connect it to a power bank, wrap it with a heating pad, and cover everything with a sock. And this is the result.
And now for something completely different. I want to share with you three very special, I guess you can call them micro encounters, one from each project that really left their long lasting mark on me personally. So first, uh, from Papua New Guinea, this is Jack Yuan. His family lives in the most remote area in the outskirts of the village, the village Yimas at the end of a long, long climb. This is their compound. And this is the view it is overlooking. I have to admit, it's not bad. The exciting revelation we had about Jack is that he's actually a genealogist. It turns out that for several years, he has been documenting every single name, date, or event related to the people of the, of the tribe, writing all of this information in notebooks in a very organized manner. For us, it was like finding a lost treasure. But try to imagine how excited was Jack when he heard about our visit and the purpose behind it. This is why upon our arrival, as a leading member of the local strings and bamboo band, he organized a sing-sing ceremony to welcome us the minute we stepped off the canoe. And here I want to show you Ohad, our team member and an extremely talented guitar player, taking on the challenge and joining the band playing together and basically communicating for the first time without even verbally interacting. Rock. And this is Riawa Nisa. One of the days in Namibia, we traveled to a remote, almost deserted Himba village, where all we found was two boys with a dog, an old woman, a teenager, another woman with a baby, a man, and one happy chicken. We really struggled with gathering all of the information, and the tree we were building seemed relatively small and lacking details. Then, out of nowhere, a herd of goats entered the village, led by this beautiful young girl. Her name is Riawanisa. She is 13 years old, and since she belongs to this family, we ask her if we can take her profile photo. She agrees, but she is very shy and is not saying anything. She is not saying anything. And the moment we are done, she runs away with the goats. For some reason, I'm very curious, and I decide to follow her path. And then, when she notices that I am expressing interest, all of a sudden she becomes a typical teenager. And she starts showing off her herding capabilities, without even one word being spoken. This is how it actually looked and sounded like. And I must tell you, I was completely shocked, since I did not expect this at all. But most of all, I was so pleased to see how confident she was and what a cool attitude she had. Just turn her back on me like this and keep on walking because she did her thing and now she's done. Last is Khenuti from Siberia. He is 50 years old and we met him during the last day of the project. Khenuti is already a grandfather, and he has several granddaughters, and what was remarkable about him to begin with, in my mind, 
was his connection with those girls. He spent a lot of time with them, playing and teaching, always being very patient and gentle. The other thing about him uh, that captured my attention was the way he told us his stories. Despite the fact they were fascinating, he would tell them very calmly in a restrained uh, fashion, without trying to scale them up or over-dramatize them. I recall one specific story about his uncle. He told us that when his uncle was 10 years old, the Soviet government confiscated all of the reindeer that belonged to the family, leaving them without any assets. So in order for his family to survive, this uncle at the age of 10 had to go out on his own to hunt for seals. And sometimes those hunting trips would take up to three days. So once coming back from such a journey, he stopped right outside the entrance of the tomb, having no idea whether the people inside are still alive or they already died of starvation. He did not dare to go in, so he tilted his head against the entrance and listened. And only after he heard breathing from the inside, he released a sigh of relief and allowed himself to finally enter. And I was amazed by this simple story. Think of what a 10-year-old boy has to go through in order to help his family survive under such circumstances. Now, Henuti also told us that he happens to know how to sing old Ninit's songs. So right before we left, I asked him whether he will be willing to dedicate his song for, he, for his youngest granddaughter, Jana. And he took her in her arms and he looked at her, but he hesitated since he was somewhat embarrassed. So he paused for a while, but then he started singing. Only later, when we had the song translated, we learned it was a lament of a young boy mourning the loss of his family. And then came this really mind-blowing moment when Henuti was looking at Jana when he finished his song and she was looking back right back at him and suddenly a tear rolled down his cheek and he wiped it and then he was done. You will see it in a minute. The Nenets are probably the toughest people living on the face of the planet and this Nenet sitting in front of us is now singing to his granddaughter and crying. For me, despite the fact we witnessed some unbelievable scenes such as the migration, this emotional moment was the absolute highlight of the project. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please thank him so much. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> That's about it. We worked very hard at my heritage to build a website to tell the story of this project. So in case you are not familiar with it, I encourage you to visit tribalquest.org. Thank you all very much for your time. I hope I did not bore you. Keep an eye on our future Tribal Quest expeditions. We do have big plans for 2018. And if I may finish with only two words, I would like to ask you, they're dreaming. Thank you.